my doctoral thesis was uh, published by the Stanford University Press as The Road to Jaramillo, uh, Critical Years of the Revolutionary Science, which was an examination of the behavior of the scientists who had produced the plate tectonics revolution. Uh, that particular piece of science was kind of in the fact. I went around and in interviewed directly and taped uh, more than 200 scientists who were signal contributors to the plate tectonics revolution. It was in, it was in that interval, those few years of writing The Road to Jaramillo, that I realized that if you came on the scene immediately after a scientific revolution had taken place, which you just had, the plate tectonics revolution, all of the people involved in it had re-sculpted their memories in the most profound ways such that the interviews failed to accord with what they themselves had published and was available to the record. And yet in interviews they told you that they had a totally different posture regarding the ideas prevalent at the time when the great plate tectonics revolution was taking place. That is, when the old fixist paradigm was being threatened by the new paradigm of continental drift and plate tectonics. It was during that episode the, that three year long series of episodes, if you will, that I realized that if anyone were going to write accurate history of science, they ought to find themselves an ongoing unresolved controversy in which we did not yet have a substantial paradigm in place and the argumentation on both sides seemed to be equally weighted and interview people before we had the answer to the whole thing. In short, do history in the fact while things were still unresolved. And that led me to, after a number of false starts, uh, taking on the subject of the question of uh, mass extinctions, are they caused by massive volcanic eruptions or by the impact of great meteorites as uh, the Alvarez group at Berkeley had suggested. And I'm now in my 25th year of a continuing longitudinal study of that. It is still unresolved still providing enormously good data from people who don't know the answer. That's excellent. When I, when I, that was what, would, what fascinated me is, is that, you know, I've heard the Lord Kelvin story. It, it's clear scientists are human beings. But you're pointing to how the institutional inertia of the structures they operate inside of are also working against learning in a certain way. On the one hand, well, on the other hand, um, creating the climate that the whole world thing's growing in. It's got, a, it's got a positive and a shadow. Uh, once the paradigm is in place, this is a guide to practice uh, with model experiments uh, down to the level of methodology, technique, tacit knowledge, and, and of course uh, overriding uh, theory or, or principle, if you will. Uh, once that's in place and uh, senior people develop a long published bibliography in which the paradigm is their major tool in doing their research. Uh, if someone comes along after they have made that investment and their published declared beliefs in, in the validity of that paradigm, 30 years down the line, someone comes along, starts threatening the paradigm. Uh, the threat of the paradigm is a threat to their dignity, esteem, and their, their own published record. Uh, how do you think senior people are likely to react to threatening ideas to their paradigm. In, in short, uh, many philosophers of science, sociologists of science, have already shown, uh, demonstrated in book-length works, how there's enormous energy expended within scientific communities in defense of the paradigm. Great tool. And it really doesn't matter what the paradigm is, this phenomenon, this, this mode of operating that we're talking about now is rampant. It's, I mean, it's uh, the, the, the thing that was most remarkable to me was the extent to which people who embraced a paradigm and published on it for decades, after their, the paradigm was overthrown, the paradigm was displaced, if you will, by a, a more satisfactory set of ideas on how to conduct their particular brand of science. When I interviewed them years after the fact, they had re-sculpted their memory in small increments over the long term to simply accord with their evolving ego needs. And that happened time and time and time again. And it turned out to be almost a truism with the exception of a few people. And I don't know the extent to which they were positioned such that they couldn't do that or wouldn't do that, but the majority did. Precisely what I just described. It's a kind of phenomenon 
which is hard to believe unless you've witnessed it. Uh, I've interviewed now uh, from my study of the plate tectonics revolution and my study of the impacting mass extinction revolution, uh, I've interviewed in excess of 600 scientists globally, probably from more than two dozen countries. Uh, nationality doesn't seem to uh, alter what I said. This is what gave rise to that old adage in physics, that the only reason physics advances is that old scientists die? Uh, well, that's, that's, called Planck's, that's called Planck's dictum, after Planck, the Nobel laureate physicist out of Germany. And Planck's dictum said that, yes, the, the old guard will defend the old paradigm. And they're so powerful and mighty within their disciplines that youngsters who have uh, new and better ideas uh, stand very little chance of making their way while the old guard is still alive and holding the reins of power. So, so science in that sense, like everything else, is uh, subordinate to the same kind of uh, self-psychological self-serving psychological bent that's running the rest of the world. Uh, the fundaments of psychology of science are no different than the fundaments of the psychology of the supermarket uh, or, or the gas station. Uh, people are people. And they defend uh, what's most precious to them. Let's uh, systematically, as if they're going to run together in the way that I use them, run through the, the key statements that define your summary of observations of the behavior of scientists. So, you, for example, the effect of discipline on reception, or the degree to which um, a hypothesis um, is uh, affecting how people choose what standard of assessment will confirm their hypothesis. Oh, that uh, whole chain. Certainly. When, when you have a conflicted idea in science, uh, data is sought to try to resolve the conflict. And uh, there are typically, there's typically, it's not a unipolar kind of investigation which everybody's in accord on what means what and how to approach the, uh, the problem solution. Uh, what, we, what we find is that uh, there are standards of appraisal or standards of assessment for data and what the data mean in place. But it turns out that depending upon whom you speak to within a given community and what their prejudices are, they may hold vastly different standards of appraisal such that two different scientists with equally valid credentials in science can observe the very same clear-cut data and come away with diametrically imposed interpretations because they are exercising different standards of appraisal. In short, People think that standards of appraisal within science are, are rigid, codified, formalized things which you can count on all the time. Uh, in point of fact, they're not. They're free-floating. They're vague, uh, uh, almost formless sometimes, very hard to get hold of, and uh, people are very little aware of this fact. I, I try to make this clear in my last book, my 94 book, uh, on the mass extinction debates. That's precisely what I found. sandbox, you know, dimension or the supermarket dimension, this seemed to have a, a very similar dynamic to politics, of having a, having the same piece of information being interpreted from two different uh, biases that are constantly trying to confirm themselves with each observation. Uh, I think that anyone who would attempt to draw an open and direct analogy between politics and science may get in a little trouble. But let's re recast what you said, if I may. Uh, are there proclivities of mind, behavior, and proclivities of temperament that seem to get exercised uh, in ways that speak for uh, subjectivity in a large measure? Uh, common to both? Yes. Uh, are they exercised with the same fervor and frequency and on the same basis? Probably not, but they do share some of the stuff I think that you're trying to allude to. In terms of the kind of fundamental undulation and movement, if not in the minutiae of processing? Uh, we, <laughs> we tend to embrace things that we're already favorably disposed toward. It's no different in science than, than it is in any other aspect of, uh, of a culture and society. So you, you find in addition to that 
Um, what are the psychological dimensions? Like, like you saw in the, the clip that I shared with you, there was a fear. This, this wasn't a necessarily a personal fear. It was a fear that um, beginning to think about it differently might derail the train that they had an invested belief was good for society. Uh, How much do you encounter that? Probably not as much, yeah? Well, it's not as socially active. Y y y y y I don't know if I understand your question correctly. Uh, are you getting at the idea that the, that the science is an institution? Uh, institutions are, are hierarchical structures. Uh, there's uh, they have enormously vested interests. I view institutions as uh, being possessed of more qualities of the organism than one would ever suspect. I, I think they're organismic. They're self-aggrandizing. They, uh, in spite of all sorts of protestations to the contrary, they are not ethical, uh, they are not moral. Uh, the institutions of science are formed up in ways that make for the efficient function, conduct, pursuit of science. But in actual operation, uh, any institutional structure, including that of science, becomes a victim of all of the lesser evils that we find in other institutions, perhaps even over into the institution of politics and certain aspects of formalized science, institutional science, it certainly has a, its own strong political components within it that regulate uh, funding and a host of other things that have to bear uh, on its eventual fruitfulness. The aligned inertia of disincentives to be really openly learned. Uh, there is resistance to discovery of new stuff in science very, very often. That's appalling. There have been whole symposia that have been uh, convened. Uh, 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 Dr. Hook at Berkeley, who is a medical doctor, uh, who has also become an historian and philosopher of science, convened a symposium about five years ago at Berkeley, out of which uh, came a book, uh, this is the book, called The Prematurity in Scientific Discovery uh, on Resistance and Neglect in Science. And it's a collection of about uh, two dozen essays, one of which is mine, on this very subject. What I'd like to do now, Bill, and this is all great, and I could, the way my mind works as I listen to you talk, is my mind like a cash register in a cartoon going ding, ding, every time I hear a jewel go by that I can see where it fits later, right? And so I've got a lot of jewels that sure. I'm looking for already. Sure. Maybe as a way of, of uh, taking a break from this trajectory and winding our way back to it for one more pass. Sure. Perhaps more fluidly. Sure. Give us a, a five or ten minute, um, as accessible as you can while still saying, you know, uh, true to Einstein, simple as, as possible, but no simpler. Um, mass extinction debate, central issue. Well, you, in, in, or, in order to talk about the mass extinction debates, you have to know that uh, a mass extinction is an extinction in, in which a, a significant uh, uh, proportion of the total taxa at a given geologic time in the past, geologic horizon, have gone extinct. And the extinction of that number of taxa marks that particular episode within Earth history, as recorded by the fossils on the Earth's crest, out as a singular. For within within it. It turns out that the geological time scale, as we know it, the subdivisions of geological time, the basic benchmarks for those subdivisions are large-scale extinctions of life. But there are a few, about a half a dozen, that are truly great, and the one in which my book of 94 was, was covering was the extinction that took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and probably 75 percent of all of the species in the sea. Uh, and uh, land life and sea life both suffered very, very greatly. Uh, up until that hypothesis that really gained some footing and produced a, a, an ongoing conflict or revolution regarding the nature of mass extinctions, uh, there was a paper published in 1980 by the Alvarez Group at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, and in science, 
And within three or four years, it, it turned into a greatly heated debate, attracted me. I dropped everything I was doing, and I picked up the study of that thing. Wrote proposals to NSF, and then was funded over the next 18 years by NSF to pursue that through a series of four major grants. And I've devoted my life to it since that time. And we're still working at it right now. Uh, the, the 94 book was, was the first book which I proposed to get out, and it's kind of a pressy, if you will, of, of a very large volume that I have in mind for the future. And inside of that, you track, in, in what I read, you track the um, kind of point, counterpoint, extension, uh, difference, uh, data doesn't fit, therefore let's stretch the hypothesis to include it, this back and forth thing of, of basically these two polarities trying to conform get on top of the other one, Certainly. confirming themselves to be right. Yeah, and, and what, what I, 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 I do a number, I do a number of conclusions uh, in the conclusion section of that book, uh, in which I showed that uh, uh, based upon the discipline or subdiscipline that one was trained in, one would examine data in ways that accorded with the paradigm of that subdiscipline. Uh, as an example, uh, probably an astounding one, which I've now published in a half a dozen uh, subsequent essays, was uh, what proportion of the geological community uh, read the hypothesis of mass extinctions by meteor impact as espoused in, in, the, Alvarez, uh, in the Alvarez hypothesis and embraced it or were openly sympathetic to it or seemed to make sense in terms of their own reading of the record. It turned out that the people who were formally charged with assessing that thing, because they were called paleontologists, they deal with fossil life, uh, something like 90 to 95 percent of them rejected it. It came from a foreign domain. It, it impugned their paradigm. It flew in the face of, of some of their most sacred ideas uh, about what could have caused extinctions in the way they did. It turns out that within the paleontologists there were about 5% of them who dealt with microfossils, particularly floating microfossils, that were severely affected by that mass extinction. And they paid attention in ways because they dealt with a group that urged them to examine this particular hypothesis of Alvarez in a way different from the others, they embraced it. But I'd say that 90 to 95% of paleontologists globally rejected the Alvarez hypothesis at its advent. In contrast, People who study meteorite impacts and the geology of other planets and look at the impact scarred faces of places like the moon and the other planets, I never found a meteoriticist or a planetary geologist who disavowed that hypothesis or was not sympathetic to it. So here we have two different communities virtually diametrically opposed looking at the very same data, but each viewing it through the lens of their particular subdiscipline, their own paradigms. You, you, can't be, you can't be more explicit than that to show the power of the paradigm in assessing, in assessing reality. There, there were, uh, the the uh, statement that, that you put in here that I thought really nailed this, partly because of the inferential authority I vest in him, I guess, in a certain way, was Gould's quote about straitjackets, right? <laughs> yeah, great. yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, Stephen Gould was uh, a friend of mine, personal friend, who used to sail with me when he came out to the Bay Area. And uh, I think one of the reasons we became friend was we were eye to eye uh, on, uh, on this business about the, the power of the paradigm and subjectivity in science. And anything you see in, in my book in which I've quoted him, th those are di direct quotes. Yeah, no, I, I have no question about that. Yeah. Uh, anything else surprise you? I mean, so what we're talking about is, is that uh, the, the kind of thinking that's going on in a school of thought or in a particular discipline is predisposing how people come into something new. And it's predisposing whether or not they're more open and embracing and learning their way into it or quickly dismissing it as being... Absolutely. The paleontology community dismissed impact as a cause for mass extinctions that they were the experts on. Now, is that what drove the, the whole volcanic uh, thrust? Is there, 
now that we understand that there was a mass extinction, it has certain the, the people who with the iridium layer at yes. the KT boundary, yes. then there has to be some reason for it. So what could that be? Oh, the volcanoes. Yeah. Uh, volcano is an alternative accorded with gradualism, with uniformitarianism, things going on on a small scale and mass extinctions being interpreted as taking millions of years, not days, weeks, months, or decades, or centuries. Got that? Yes. So what we have here is not only do we have the argument based on, on the stuff that's coming out of the record itself, but we have an entire long philosophic framework in which the philosophical mainstay of the earth sciences is the principle of uniformitarianism, which says that the present is the key to the past, and that uniformitarianism is a handmaiden of another mainstay of that, and that is gradualism, uniformitarianism, and the whole notion of evolution of life is tied into that gradualism and uniformitarianism. They, they really travel as handmaidens within the larger framework, the philosophic framework for the earth sciences. Alvarez comes along with this hypothesis in 1980 that the dinosaurs and the great extinction 65 million years ago at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is produced by a single great impact. And he flies in the face of 200 years of, of published philosophy and textbooks on the subject. He's saying this was near instantaneous in geologic terms. It happened in such a short time frame that you've got to put on new glasses and start re-examining your record. Wouldn't have uh, Gould punctuated the equilibrium somewhat set the stage for thinking differently about the gradualism? No. Why? No. Uh, I've been over this one uh, more times than you can think. Uh, it, it's something that is best for us not to enter because the intricacies of punctuated equilibrium theory within paleontology, with evolutionary biology, it, it's very, very difficult. And it, it really does not have great bearing on this. And, and I've been over this with Steve uh, Gould, who is the author it seems like that there's a of punctuated equilibrium, as you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, along, along with a colleague of his. And uh, it, it simply doesn't work that way. It's, it's, not, it's not going to work, no. I think that Steve Gould was open to this whole idea and he embraced, by the way, Steve Gould did embrace the Alvarez theory at its advent. Uh, there's no question about it. And he was one of the minority of the paleontologists who did so. Yes. And would that, in his case, have been on account of his uh, thinking of I think he was. I think he was a larger, open-minded thinker. With, uh, with, he was so broadly based. He was so widely read. He was so open-minded that he was never, he never fell victim to the one paradigm view of anything. Well, I should say of most things. Uh, I've seen him in other areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear him over my shoulder saying, I've seen you too, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, gosh, I'm really happy with what we've covered already. The jewels good. are in there relative to the behavior. Well, so you know. What, what haven't we talked about? And you, you have some anecdotal stories of um, scientists doing crazy things that help illustrate the psychological biases like the Kelvin story or things that are on that continuum that would I, I can, be, some, be some spice. I, 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 can, I can show you, I can, I can tell you something like that. Okay. Uh, sure. And this, these people shall go nameless since they're not yet published or living and I, and I, don't, I, I don't impugn people and their motives and reputations. I, yeah, uh, not, I, I work at a craft uh, in, in which uh, what's told to me has to be secret and things go in a barrel and I have to be very, very careful about undermining people's reputation. So you work in time capsules? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, it's very difficult doing, doing contemporary history of science has uh, techniques, methods, uh, uh, admonitions, cautions that you don't have to worry about when they're long dead and buried. Doing antique history is quite a different thing. And I, I've tried to explain this to antique historians. Uh, most of them, I think, have gotten it by now. Uh, there, there was an example. Uh, one of the uh, fossil groups uh, that was affected at the KT boundary were the plants. And the people who study fossil plants are called paleobotanists. There was a rather notable one particular paleobotanist in particular. This was true of many, but this is a, an episode which I think is great grist for, uh, for TV Mill. Uh, he, uh, he published against that. He said that the fossil record did not accord with uh, instantaneous extinction. 
that he saw a gradual extinction in it, and he, he held on to this for a few years, the early years of the Alvarez thing. Uh, people suggested to him that perhaps he did not examine the record closely enough in the field in certain sites that lent themselves to detailed examination of what was uh, the actual state of the biological transition through the sequence of beds that represented the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And he went back out, he found a single site for the first time in his life, and he was converted in the field within minutes at that site, and then published, began publishing on the other side of the fence. I think I think it's connected to the fact that uh, he was a man, and by the way, he's a, a first-rate person. Uh, he was a man who was possessed of that set of glasses that the institution puts on one. You start as a youngster, uh, you're fully imbued with the paradigm, uh, you get a set of glasses through which you examine reality, and uh, the broader interpretations that are taken by the high priests whom you revere, they, they brought you up, nurtured you, gave you your salary, your grants to do research, uh, they gave you your letters of recommendation, your honors and awards. It's the entire system of being totally vested down to the root of one's soul in a particular discipline when you embrace this. You can't separate out embrace of the paradigm from all of the personal particulars that make for a complete human life. Except that the paradigm may lie at the very center of this thing. That's why it's so threatening. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, do no harm, though, in medical, that, that of an ethic that transcends the, the person somewhat as a compass, you know, to function with, rather than getting lost in all of these allegiances that work against the spirit of the enterprise. Yeah. So, do you have any solutions to any of this? You're just an observer. Oh, uh, I, uh, you know. Uh, so, so I don't understand your question. Solution to what? What is it we want to solve here? Yeah, okay. Is there, is there some path for science to become more learning oriented in its communal practice that, to deal with this kind of um, you know, shadowy, unhealthy behavior with your collective learning? I, 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 I made make a plea for just what you're asking was my, my question was uh, I convened a symposium back at Northwestern University in uh, 1990 and at the end of the symposium uh, we had a, a two-hour panel discussion in which I had some of the most articulate people these were people from all over the world and I asked the question how should history of science and sociology of science serve science What's our job? We're saying, how do we serve them? Uh, we could get no, no one to volunteer a formal answer. No one would commit themselves. It was, it, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, but I've answered it myself. I think that we have to work assiduously to point out uh, the root seeds, the origins of uh, subjectivities and intellectual prejudice. And that's, that's highfalutin talk, but extremely hard to do. What I closed my chapter on, on this book that was published by uh, Ernie Hook, he was editor, who was edited this, this fellow from Berkeley, published the volume on resistance uh, and neglect in science, on uh, what we call prematurity and scientific discovery also. I ended that chapter by quoting uh, two social philosophers uh, 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 who wrote a book called The Mature Mind. Uh, these are the Overstreets, Harry and Benito Overstreet. And they closed the mature mind, which they wrote a half century ago, and nothing better has been read, written since. They closed the mature mind with a statement that uh, the single best criterion that they could put in place to judge whether or not you had a mature mind in front of you was the single ability. You reckoned the person as to whether they were a mature mind on the ability to hold a suspended judgment. And we can't. I say it very elegantly, and I've written it in essays.
and I watch myself in daily action in life, it's so deeply rooted in our being that unless you're mindful of it through some formal exercise, you fall right back into the trap, and I do too, irrespective of everything I've said. That's how dangerous the whole thing is. We may have talked about this years ago. This is a complete connection with um, what I used to think of as the it is so radiation, the, the professor in us that's, that's, that's it is sowing, and just our carrier web, right? And Bohm, David Bohm, the core of his work, everything was suspension. There was no freedom for dialogue. There was no freedom for personal growth if you couldn't suspend yourself in motion. It's it's almost impo it's almost impossible. It, it it's a Herculean task. It is. I've thought about this endlessly, more than anything. I I think in in all the philosophy of science. Uh, I don't know how to get a mindset where you can be get some guarantee that you're suspending your judgment most of the time you know now is this a i'm take a little straight or just fly with you on this do you think that this is a um a kind of bias of our constitutional cognitive infrastructure or a psychologically acquired uh, behavior of selfing no i i'm a genetic determinist i come out of evolutionary biology uh, when I was a youngster and I took my first sociology course at uh, 17 as an undergraduate, I was convinced because of my poverty-stricken background that 90% of my shortcomings were due to culture. Uh, 50 years later, I'm convinced that 90% of my shortcomings are due to my genetic inheritance. And I think that this has led me to become in later life a genetic determinist. I think that our inability to hold a suspended judgment is part of our inheritance from evolutionary biology. And uh, it, it served the groups from which we've evolved over, say, the last three million years, hunter-gatherer groups. Uh, you couldn't hold a suspended judgment, not for a second, because you had to make life and death decisions several times a day. And they had to be made quickly based on what you knew to be most workable in the past to stay alive. And I think that it's a deeply rooted genetically based thing that carries over uh, after high culture arises and you've got a big intellectual framework that will not touch the basic neuronal framework by, by which we come to our inability to hold a suspended judgment. So it's titanic social genetic inertia? I, I know. I, I think that we, everything you see evolved out there as cultural, cultural artifacts, cultural proclivities, institutions, they are nothing more than a collectivized and institutionalized expression of individual genetic propensity. That's part of our inheritance. I am a genetic determinist. It's a great conversation. We'll go more into the disconnect here. Um, yep. What haven't we talked about that you think bears on helping people understand the institutional and personal psychological biases that work against real learning in science? Oh, they're, they're simply enormous. They're simply enormous. Let, let me give you a good example. I've examined all of the research proposals written at the major institutions that produced the data that proved continental drift to be true, that triggered the plate tectonics revolution. I've gone back to those institutions. I've examined their research proposals. Are we mounting an expedition? Are we mounting an experiment to seek data to prove or disprove confirm or disconfirm the idea of continental drift. In all the institutions that serendipitously, accidentally stumbled on the data that absolutely confirmed the truth of continental drift, seafloor spreading, and plate tectonics eventually, not a single institution ever wrote a single research proposal in that time saying, we are out to find out whether continental drift is true or not. For the simple reason that if you showed open sympathy for continental drift in the decades before it was confirmed, you could not get tenure or never be hired up. Uh, the doyen of continental drift in the Southern Hemisphere over in Australia at this time did his doctorate in the 30s, in the 1930s, at the University of uh, Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Uh, I went and lived with him in his home for a series of interviews. He told me, and by the way, he was, he's the smartest geologist I have ever met in my entire life. 
out of, out of the 650 I've interviewed. His doctoral dissertation was submitted and he was espousing continental drift as part of his study. His doctoral committee at Sydney told him they could not give him the degree if he did not go back and expunge the material on continental drift and turn it in and they would sign it. And he did. He went back, got his degree, and then published the dissertation in full, espousing continental drift, which he did all the way up until the 1960s when it was confirmed 30 years later. And that man was Samuel Warren Carey, who was the foundation professor of geology at the uh, University of Hobart in Tasmania. In the footsteps of Galileo. Right. That's right. Yep. <laughs>